Uh, greetings and welcome to our lectionary podcast here for Epiphany series, oh, Epiphany 4 series B, looking at Deuteronomy 18 verses 15 to 20, a passage that in many ways is quite pivotal in that it expresses a hope, a promise that after Moses will come the prophet, a prophecy ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. The language itself emphasizes again and again the important role of the prophet who contrasts with the false prophets. This passage itself looms large in terms of its broader canonical context, not only in terms of Jesus' ministry, but also in the way that the prophets themselves write. Isaiah himself, for example, oftentimes uses very mosaic imagery, indicating that even Isaiah may have seen himself as following in the footsteps of Moses. That said, let's take a look at this text and how it defines the role of a prophet. This is different than what's been going on up until this point, in which we've had both the king's roles defined and also ad nauseum the priesthood. This prophet is different in that he is one whom God chooses and the people have nothing to do with his choosing. That said, now let's move over to the board and take a look at this text, beginning now in verse 15. Navi Mikarevka, a prophet. Note what goes on here in the first word. We would expect VSO, verb, subject, object, here it's violated, and the emphasis now sets the stage for who on earth is Navi. A prophet from your midst, from the midst, not only your midst, but also your brothers. This is an apposition. This tells us one of the characteristics. A prophet must be an Israelite, like me. Moses is the paradigmatic prophet. And now every prophet who comes after him will play the Mosaic role. Remember, after this passage, there's no more Moses after Deuteronomy. I know that's sort of basic Sunday school stuff. But the issue becomes, how will God continue to speak and continue to reveal his word? Like me, Yahweh will raise up for you. And note this is a hifil here. And we know it's a hifil because of the interior dot vowel. The comments tells us it's a hollow the Hirik Yod tells us it's a Hifil from Kum, a fairly basic Bartelt unit, whatever early on word. Uh, Yahweh will raise up for you. The Lamed preposition, that's a Lamed of advantage. Will raise up from Yahweh, your God will raise up for you, and you will listen to him. Note here, again, we have VSL being violated. The fronting is the indirect object. You will listen to him. According to all which you ask, again, we're dealing with a lot of basic Cal verbs, so nothing super exciting here. All which you ask from Yahweh your God, note again the, uh, the possessive suffix here. It's your God, your God. Which you ask from Yahweh your God on Horeb in the day of the assembly. Now we're going back to Sinai, which has already been in the background of a good chunk of Deuteronomy saying, no longer again speak. Uh, this word itself is sort of odd. It's a hippo from Yasaf, Yod, Samek, He. The Holom tells us it's a Holom Vav, which is what hippos do in first Yods. So I will no longer again, let me no longer again, here take it sort of as coordinative, no longer again hear the voice of Yahweh. So let me no longer hear the voice of Yahweh, my God, and, the fi and, the great fi and this great fire. Uh, note the demonstrative adjective always comes at the end that modifies that, which modifies that. This, uh, this great fire, let me not see anymore. Uh, vavs in Hebrew are uh, the ubiquitous vavs. Vav, vav, everywhere a vav. Here, take this perhaps as purpose in order that I may not die. The people are stuck in a bit of a tension. They want an authoritative teacher, but they cannot stand Yahweh's presence. And Yahweh answers that first through Moses, but then ultimately through the prophet. And Yahweh said to me, here's a hifl of Yatav. You know it's a hifl because of the hay, of the hay sere. Uh, this thing, it is good, what they, are, what, they, what they have said. And now note the repetition here of verse 15. Now, be is fronted, 
a prophet I will raise up for them from the midst of their brothers like you. And I will give my words in his mouth, and he will speak to them all which I command him. Note that's a PL, and we know a PL from the old mantra of schwa patak doubling, with the object suffix, all which I command him, and anyone, and it will be, take here by Yaha is fairly oblique, and it will be anyone, each typically translate that as man, here take it as generic, and anyone, and it will be anyone who does not listen to my words, which he speaks in my name. And now note on a key, generally get excited about personal pronouns. I guess, I bet you never thought you'd hear that, that personal pronouns are exciting. In Hebrew, they're redundant. And Yahweh emphasizes that he is the one who will vindicate the true prophet. I myself will require from him. Uh, Darash here, being used for the sense, has the sense of being used for a call to account. I will call to account from him. An ak, surely. And now we have a contrast. The prophet who yatzid. Yatzid is a word that you probably have never seen before. I surely didn't until I took a look at this. It means to presume. Uh, here it means to take the place of an authoritative teacher. Uh, this is not just being slightly presumptuous by asking a silly question in class. This is a person who usurps the divinely given prophetic, pr pr prophetic role, who presumes to speak. There's your hip uh, PL infinitive construct. Speak a word in my name, the one who, which I did not command. No, we have a resumptive pronoun. So take that as which, which I did not command him to speak. And what he speaks in my name and, and who, take this as another good old share, can mean a lot. And who will speak in the name of even worse other gods, he, that prophet will die. So note the contrast that we have as we take a look at this text. The issue becomes, how will God speak? And after these times, this issue here in 20 starts looming large. False prophets happen again and again. People have a tendency to listen to the wrong person. And now this brings us to how to use this text and what to do with it. In terms of the gospel reading, this is sort of an odd pairing. We'd be actually expecting here to have this more as in a transfiguration reading when you have Moses making an appearance, telling us the significance of the transfiguration. But here the people have a mar in Mark 1, 21 to 28, they marvel over uh, why is Jesus able to teach with authority? And this passage in the background tells us why. He is the prophet promised of old, the promise in the footsteps of Moses. Throughout Jesus' ministry, he is this great prophet. And as a prophet, he proclaims God's word of hope, and also God's word of doom that contrasts with all the false prophets that the people have heard and the people have followed. False prophets that are in the background of a good chunk of, frankly, the entire Old Testament, whether it's Isaiah's necromancers or the Pharisees and the Sadducees that are in the background here in Mark chapter 1. So what does it mean for Jesus to be Moses, for Jesus to be the prophet? Jesus becomes the one who, com who, who comes in order, to, in order to meet the people face to face. Comes not in terror, but comes to dwell among us and to speak this word of consolation, this word of both law and the word of gospel. And I would play around with that, thinking how I would preach this. That way back here in Deuteronomy, we had a promise of a prophet, a promise that ultimately comes to fulfillment in Christ, who is the great prophet, who is the one who preaches this message of hope. Enjoy this text. It's in the background of so much of Old Testament theology. And I pray that, you, that your blessings as you preach this text to your people. God's blessings upon your preaching for this Epiphany 4 Series B.